Is it okay if I get loud for a second? Oh, hell yeah. Hey everyone, it's October 6th, 2023. I'm at MSP Minneapolis Airport on my way to Austin, Texas to see and document Sky Stang 1 in person, Kurt Cobain's actual Mustang. Let's go. I'm going to tell you the story of one of the best days of my life. It was surreal, life-changing, and a dream come true. It all started when Julian's auctions reached out to me they swore me to secrecy and shared that Sky Stang 1 would be going up for auction very soon. They told me that in four days, they were going to shoot an interview with Kurt's guitar tech, Ernie Bailey, and Kurt's brother, Chad Cobain, with Sky Stang 1 in between them. The entire interview being centered around the guitar's story and both of their connections to that guitar and Nirvana in general. Julian said that if I could get myself to Austin, Texas, that I could not only be in the room as the interview was shot, but could then get direct access to Sky Stang 1 to document it up close. This was the opportunity of a lifetime. If you know me and have been following my channel, you know that Sky Stang 1 is not only my favorite Kurt Cobain guitar, but my favorite guitar of all time. Kurt is on record saying that the Mustang is his favorite guitar, and Sky Stang 1 is his most played Mustang his main guitar on Nirvana's last two tours. He played it nearly every night on the Neutro tour and played it at Nirvana's last show. My Nirvana guitar history video series all started with my Sky Stang 1 episode. I loved doing the research and piecing together a definitive timeline of this guitar. This was all short notice, but there was no way I was not going to be there. Four days after my phone call with Julian's, I was in Austin riding with their video production crew to the studio where the interview was going to take place. It all happened at Arlen Studios, an absolutely gorgeous facility that has a rich history of amazing albums and live performances that were recorded there. There, I met Ernie, Chad, and Julian's co-founder, Martin. I stood there in awe as the interview was being filmed, trying to wrap my head around the fact that the real actual Sky Stang 1 was right there. When things were getting set up for the interview, there were talks of Ernie potentially playing it. I had brought three pedals, my Sans Amp Classic, Small Clone, and Echo Flandre Clone. I quickly offered them to Ernie, and he accepted. I couldn't believe it, but I found myself setting up my pedals for Kurt Cobain's guitar tech to play Sky Stang 1 through. So in Julian's video, when Ernie's playing the guitar, He's playing it through my pedals, and I, I can't believe I can say that. Chad blew all of our minds when he casually shared that the strings on the guitar are original. He received the guitar from Courtney Love a few weeks after Kurt passed, and he said that until that day, the guitar had not been played. So we are talking almost 30-year-old strings that Kurt Cobain played his last show with. These strings were probably put on right before Nirvana's final show, on March 1st, 1994, in Germany. Ernie asked about my research to set up the pedals in the same configuration Kurt used 30 years ago and asked me to set my echo flanger for both Scentless Apprentice and radio-friendly unit shifter. Before the cameras rolled, we watched in awe as this guitar made those wonderful sounds again after being silent for nearly 30 years. <laughs> With the interview and playing portion complete, the shoot was done and it was a wrap on Julian's end. We all clapped and shook each other's hands to celebrate a successful shoot and I finally had the opportunity to talk with both Chad and Ernie. Chad was extremely kind and welcoming. It was unreal to be speaking one-on-one -on -one with a member of the Cobain family. And it was so exciting to get to meet and talk to Ernie. With Kurt sadly not around anymore, Ernie is the leading authority for all things related to his gear. He told me that he appreciated what I do on my channel, thanking me for preserving the history 
and presenting the information in a scholarly way. I really can't tell you guys how that made me feel. I will never get higher validation than that. Coming directly from Kurt Cobain's guitar tech himself, it was overwhelming and the highest honor to receive praise like that. After talking for a bit, Ernie said to me, well, have you seen it yet? And we made our way back to the guitar. It's hard to describe, but the gravity of what was in front of me didn't fully sink in right away. I'm so used to my Sky Stang build and seeing my followers builds that my mind instantly wanted to go, oh, it's just another Sky Stang tribute build. But then it hit that no, this is the real deal. This is the live and loud guitar. This is Kurt's number one in utero tour guitar that he played at possibly every show. With the footage that is currently available to us, we know it was his most played guitar on that tour by a long shot. All the other Stangs don't even come close. In the interview, Ernie even said that based on its heavy use, it's likely that this was Kurt's favorite guitar of the in utero era. It was the workhorse, the one he always relied on and went back to night after night. I asked Ernie for a picture and he said, of course, but you're holding it. And this right here, this is my favorite photo that I got that day. With being able to hold it so up close and with Ernie right there, I asked him a few things I had always wondered about it. Why did Kurt smear the Seymour Duncan logo on the JB? Ernie said that he was actually the one that did that, saying he didn't like having the logo there. Why the Nashville-style tunomatic bridge on this guitar, when the other in utero stangs got ABR Goto bridges? He said that that just happened to be the bridge that he had at the time when he was first modding the guitar, saying that the bridge probably came from one of his own guitars. He shared that when they first received the guitar from the custom shop, he felt it was very well built as was typical for Fender Japan, but that it would need several modifications before it was put into Kurt's hands. He feels a special connection to this guitar in particular, because he modded it so extensively with Kurt. He took what was originally designed as a student level guitar and transformed it into the workhorse that went on to be Kurt's main guitar on Nirvana's two biggest headlining tours. When asked why Kurt played it so much, Ernie said he wasn't 100% sure and didn't want to put words in Kurt's mouth. Ernie said, it's hard to say, we like what we like. It's a real possibility that this might have been Kurt's favorite guitar. The statistics that we have for this guitar completely backs that up. While it did see some throws and a decent amount of damage, it was never outright smashed or destroyed to pieces. Ernie said that initially, he didn't expect this guitar to survive the first week of the tour. It says a lot about how Kurt felt about this guitar, that it lasted the entire tour, and that it is intact and playable to this day. After talking to Ernie about the guitar, I went straight to work and started documenting this historic instrument as best as I could. Never in a million years did I ever think I'd be handling, touching, examining, and documenting this instrument. It was truly a full circle moment for me. The first Kurt guitar I ever saw in person was Sky Sting 3 at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2009. As a teenager whose Nirvana obsession was brand new, I was completely starstruck for this instrument and I couldn't leave it. That experience, seeing that guitar in person, really made an impression on me. When we got back home from that trip, I printed that photo and had it up in my room, side by side with this live picture. Yes, I know that Kurt is playing Sky Stang 1 in this photo, and that's not the guitar that I am pictured with. I didn't know better at the time, but this was really the beginning of this guitar becoming my favorite, and shaping my taste in guitars in general. I had only been playing for a few years at that point. I had an Epiphone Les Paul at the time, but now all I wanted was a blue Mustang with a red pickguard. I started focusing on my footage of Kurt playing his Sky Stangs. I love every era of Nirvana, don't get me wrong, but the Neutro Tour hits differently and made a huge impact on me as a young guitarist who is just learning how to play. The guitars and pedals Kurt played and the tones on that tour became my favorites and they still are to this day. With having this once in a lifetime opportunity, I had made a list of things I wanted to be sure to document. First was the color. 
there has been much debate about exactly what shade of blue it is, and if there's any green tint to it or not. It's very hard to determine with live pictures and videos. Stage lighting has made this guitar look blue, green, and even pure white. My good friend Jeff at Lomic Guitars is an expert for all things regarding this guitar and has been studying and specifically researching its color for a long time now. I went to him for guidance on how I would best be able to determine the color in person. This is another full circle moment as Jeff and I collaborated on my original History of Sky Staying One video and he provided invaluable information and insight about the technical side of the guitar. He suggested that I bring some swatches and that would help determine the amount of blue and if there's any green. I used these three swatches, Bears Soft Turquoise, Pure Turquoise, and Green Parakeet. Unfortunately, none of these three were an exact match. Pure Turquoise came out to be the closest. To my eyes, in person, I saw no hints of green, just a light shade of sonic blue, definitely lighter than the official Fender Kurt Cobain signature Mustang that I own. I sent Jeff my findings and he worked his magic. He did a full on color analysis. He used the pure turquoise pictures, edited a tiny piece of the swatch to match the guitar perfectly, got the RBG color values of before and after the edits, then applied the same change to the known RGB values of pure turquoise and averaged the two samples to get what we are concluding what might be the true sky stain color to the best of our abilities without having it color matched. The closest swatch that there is to this exact color would be Bear's Big Surf, M463. The next most important thing to me was seeing if there was any damage, and if there was, to what extent. It does have a decent amount of battle scars, as would be expected for a guitar that was used so heavily by such an intense performer. I'm going to walk you through all the damage that I saw on this guitar. But before we start, I'd like to give a big shout out to everyone who has donated to me via buymeacoffee.com. These videos take a long time to research and edit and put together, so the extra caffeine really helps out. I can't thank you guys enough. Let's start with the front. What I was most surprised by were the little circle dings under the tailpiece. Ernie said that this was from Kurt poking the body with the guitar cable to get Sonic Youth-like sounds. Other than that, the front of the body was pretty clean overall. More damage is visible on the back. There are two notable spots on the edges where chunks of paint are missing and the wood is visible. Could either of them have come from the big throw on February 22nd, 1994? It does almost look like it initially hits where spot two is on the upper bout, but it's hard to say. Another big thing on the back are the two cracks running through the body, one on both sides of the neck plate. Both sides go all the way to the neck pocket. A ding here, by the bottom of the bigger crack. Now, let's talk about where the most visible damage is. Both strap buttons. Both were obviously relocated several times. We can see that by all the wood that is exposed. It's crazy if you really stop to think about it. How hard this guitar must have been played and swung around for this to be needed. There's a strap button hole on the lower horn, which could make you think that at some point it was flipped for righty, but Ernie said that he believes this was something one of the techs might have done on the European leg of the tour. If we focus our attention now to the pickguard, we can see another mod that was done for the European leg, the pickup switches. These were believed to have been modified by Jim Vincent, as Kurt had problems with accidentally hitting them while strumming. 
I can tell you that from feeling them, these are cut quite short. There is no way they would accidentally move anymore. It is stunning to see the pick guard so up close. The red tort is beautiful and vibrant. The pick guard material is specific to that time. Fender started using different material around 1995. That's why today it's nearly impossible to find a red tortoiseshell pick guard with random yellow specks. It was surreal to see the yellow V so up close. That has become a defining characteristic of Sky Stang 1. It is visible in so many live pictures, so much footage. I'm so used to seeing it on a screen and almost didn't feel real to look at that V up close. Ernie himself even said, when the guitar was first received, he thought that the V was distracting, but now over time, it has become his favorite part of the guitar visually. A funny part though when it comes to the pickguard is that there is a little gap between it and the control plate right over here. I did my best to measure the pickup heights. I'm very embarrassed to admit this, but when looking over my photos after the fact, I noticed that I did not have the ruler flush to the body for the JB. Jeff again worked his magic and had enough to work with to make an accurate measurement out of it. Thankfully, I did do a decent enough job when it came to the neck pickup's height. What was probably my biggest nerd moment of the day was geeking out over the knobs. There's nothing really noticeable to say about them. I just couldn't stop thinking about the live and loud show, how we clearly see Kurt adjusting this exact volume knob when kicking into breed. Let's now move on to the neck. Going up the neck, on the left side, there are almost little circles around some of the frets. On the right side, we see two dings right around the fourth and fifth frets. The nut is original. It was cracked at some point and repaired between the D and G strings. On the headstock, there is a ding right above the F in Fender. This is the part I probably had the most difficult time documenting visually. It's hard to tell, but when you feel it, it is indented and sinks down a tiny bit. There are several chips at the top of the headstock. Getting the overall weight was also important to me. It came out to six pounds, nine and a half ounces. On the same scale, my Mustang weighs 7 pounds, 5.6 ounces. I realized right away when picking up the actual Sky Sting for the first time that it felt lighter than mine, but it's fun to see the exact differences. From my perspective, the neck is also skinnier than the Kurt Cobain signature Mustang. Sky Sting's neck felt much more like my 1995 Jag Sting's neck. So from all the guitars I've ever played and have experience with, I would say that the original run of the 90s Jagstangs has the closest feeling neck to the actual Skystang one. Overall, Skystang felt very light and easy to carry. I can see how Kurt comfortably played it for hours at a time on tour. Keeping in mind that he had scoliosis, one could speculate that the light weight was a factor in how often he played it. So with my pedal set up and the amp that Ernie played through still being out and available, I can't believe I can actually say this, but I played Sky Stang 1. I tried at first to play Lefty, but it was hard, and it felt like I had never played a day in my life. This is me struggling through Heart Shape Box left-handed. I I flipped it over, switched on my echo flanger, and made some radio-friendly unit shifter sounds. If I look nervous, it's because I really was. The guitar itself is really light, 
but the metaphorical weight of what I was holding, plus knowing that these were the original strings, made the guitar feel, again metaphorically, very heavy. It's overwhelming to think that on that tour, when the lights went out and the crowd started to go nuts, it was silent until Kurt started making these sounds with this exact guitar. These were the first sounds that the thousands who saw that tour heard while watching the silhouettes of Nirvana come on stage before the rest of the band kicked in and the lights went on. This experience happened less than three weeks after the 30th anniversary of the release of In Utero. Even though this guitar was not used on the album, it will always be the In Utero guitar in my mind due to its prominent use on the In Utero tour. I would argue that there is no other guitar that better represents that era, visually and sonically. I can't think of a better way to have celebrated my favorite album's 30th anniversary than to spend time with the historic instrument that defines that era, an iconic guitar whose image and sound is forever etched into music history. It got to the point where I had gotten all that I had set out to get, but it was so hard to stop taking pictures of it and just in general, stop inspecting it. I knew that this was a once in a lifetime thing and that I will never have access like this ever again. Once I got what I needed, one of Julian's production crew members very kindly took pictures of me holding it before I put it down for good. The actual auction for this guitar will take place in Nashville, Tennessee on November 16th, 17th, and 18th, 2023 as a part of Julian Auctions Played, Worn, and Torn Rock and Roll Iconic Guitars and Memorabilia Auctions. Julian's currently holds the world record for the two most expensive guitars ever sold. Kurt's Martin D18E for $6 million in first place and his Competition Mustang for $4 million in second place. I have no doubt that Sky Stang 1 Kurt's most played Mustang and the guitar he played his very last show with will also reach those heights and break some records. My day could have ended right here and it'd be one of the greatest days of my life. But crazy enough, this was just the first half. A little bit before he left, Ernie very casually said to me, would you like to go see the Foo Fighters show at ACL? By this, he meant going side stage to see the Foo Fighters headline Austin City Limits that night. I don't even remember how I initially reacted. I remember freezing and saying, wait, are you serious? To which Ernie said, yes, of course. I said yes probably a million times over. I was so surprised and shocked that I don't really know how I said yes and how I thanked him. A few hours later, I found myself with Ernie, Chad Cobain, and his wife as we all walked into ACL to go see the Foo Fighters. We got our guest passes and got lost trying to find the correct VIP entrance we could go into. We got so turned around that eventually we stopped and Ernie said to me, keep an eye out for Pat, he's gonna come grab us. A few minutes later, there was Pat Smear at the main stage gate walking towards the crowd to find us as people were scrambling for their cell phone cameras. We all ran to him and he guided us through the maze that is the backstage of a major music festival until we got to the Foo Fighters trailer area and Dave Grohl was right there talking to some friends. I was introduced to both Dave and Pat by Ernie. I was so starstruck and trying not to show it and trying to play it cool that all I was able to get out was, hi, I'm Eric, as I shook their hands. Things happened so quickly and mentally I was in such a rush. I got a quick picture with Pat, but I did not have the chance to get one with Dave. So you will have to take my word for it. I swear, I did get introduced to him and shook his hand. He gave us all a glass of champagne, so I can show you the glass that Dave Grohl handed to me. I knew going into Austin that I was about to live out a dream by seeing my favorite guitar so up close. But I could have never guessed that I would end up completing something that was at the top of my bucket list, meeting all the surviving core members of Nirvana, the band that means so much to me and that has changed my life in multiple ways. A little while after being introduced to them, we were told by the crew to go get to the side of the stage as the guys were about to go on. This was my view of the show.
I'm back in my hotel room in Austin. It's October 7th for the next 10 minutes. It's about to be midnight. I need to be at the airport in like three hours, but after this day, I don't even know if I'm gonna be able to sleep. It's hard to put into words everything that happened today. I'm in disbelief. I just got off FaceTime with my wife and she was like, tell me all about it. And I was like, so much happened that I don't even know where to start. My favorite guitar of all time. Like that was the real, the real Sky Sting. Like I had it in front of me with Ernie Bailey to my side and like, like asking questions about it with, with Ernie right there and it just, I cannot thank Julian's Auctions enough for inviting me out, Ernie Bailey for just being amazing and being so friendly, being so generous with his time and with his stories, Chad Cobain for being super warm and super friendly and for allowing me to hold and examine you know, his guitar with the way that he allowed me to. And then to end the day, seeing Foo Fighters backstage and briefly meeting Pat and Dave like this all happened in one day like I can't I can't describe it I can't comprehend it and something I've been trying to wrap my head around is like how how did I get here I get followers that ask me oh are you affiliated with the band or with Fender Do you know people before today I didn't at the end of the day I'm just a fanatic with a YouTube channel. I just love gathering information for my history videos. I just love recreating tones and creating videos that show other people how they can do it. For those videos to have gotten me the experiences I got today, I just, I can't, I can't, I can't fathom it. Like it's, it's truly a dream come true. I have all you guys to thank for it, for supporting the channel, for watching, for subscribing, for commenting, for sharing my videos. It's, it's cause of you guys that like today happened and I'm so happy I was able to document Sky Sting 1 and the way I was able to, to just get all the details, all the dings, all the imperfections on it. I'm really happy to create that visual record to, so it's out there and it's preserved cause who knows like who buys it, this might go on display again. We might never see it again, it might go to a private collector. So I'm really happy to put out a record of it that's like this is how Sky Sting 1 looks present day. And this is how it sounds. Like I, I got to play the thing and it's, this is gonna take a long time for me to like let this day settle and for me to look back and be like, yeah, I, I did those things. Cause all day I've just been saying to myself, like w I'm gonna wake up. Like in any second now, I'm gonna wake up and be at home. Cause today, today isn't real. <laughs> it's funny. we. You know, we own property like you. So, the camera? No, the this light. Uh, okay, if I get loud for a second. Oh, hell yeah.